Five. Or why don't one each person take a take a scripture? I'll, I'll, Table one. I'll take number one. That's Exodus. Exodus nineteen five. Now, now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my be my treasure treasure for. Possession. Possession, although the whole earth is mine. No. No? Okay. So let's, let's uh, what does that mean? Can you, can you elaborate on that? What does that mean? That if you don't, that... It, it's, to me, um... Uh, Somebody want to help her out? Yeah. Um, Don't stress. Mm. <laughs> Somebody want to help her out? Well, in the next verse below it, mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 11, um, God is is explaining the covenant. I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today, and the curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God and turn away. And turn from the way that I command you today by following other gods that you have known. Um, yeah, God is really serious about us keeping this covenant. Yeah. About the Jews. He's, he's talking to the Jews here, the Israelites. Yes. Um, he is serious about keeping the covenant. And but if they don't, but if they don't fulfill the co if they don't fulfill the covenant, they won't. They won't have God's blessing. They won't have. Yeah, that's what I was. You know what, Lorraine? I, I know that right here they're talking to the, the, the Jews in Israel, mm -hmm. but I really believe this <coughs> pertains to us. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. it does. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, because yeah. if we don't, if we don't, if we don't come. Um, Keep the the covenant. We won't be. We won't be. We won't have God's blessing. We won't have God's blessing. And that's to the individual as well as the nation. Uh -huh. That's what the, that's the, the nation is. Yes. He's mentioning the nations here. Yeah, Lorraine just oh, ran out. And we can see that today. You know. You know what? You know, you know, what, what, what I like about this is that God doesn't force us to do anything. Mm -hmm. no. he, he says, "I said it before you." You got. Blessings and curses. Now you choose. Mm -hmm. So he said that before us. And what does that mean? We choose. And the blessing, if you obey the commands, that's one thing I love about God is that He never punishes anybody without giving you a warning. He does that all throughout Scripture. You know, He did it with Adam and Eve. He He did it here. You know, before the Israelites, and He's doing that for us today. Yeah. That's why it's important for us to know the word. Yeah. Because if you go against the word, then there's going to be some serious consequences. Well, one of the points of the covenant, and it applies today certainly, mm -hmm. um, is he would deal with their enemies. Mm -hmm. yeah. He would take care of their enemies. Yeah, they would always right. have victory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that's true for all of God's people because we're grafted in to the covenant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He wouldn't but, allow them to, ha to have any of the sicknesses the nations around them would have. Isn't that something? It's amazing, yes. And, and their children, their children would, would be blessed, so their children would, wouldn't be going off into drugs and you know, things we could think of today. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, that's why his word is so important. Gosh. You know, you reflect back to Jesus at the well with the, with the woman. Mm -hmm. And he said, this water, you'll never thirst. Mm -hmm. But people keep drinking the other water, the physical water. <laughs> thinking, that, and they keep searching. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, he, and, you know, he gives us the key <laughs> throughout all scripture. And I'm thinking, you know, I've never seen it. Like, every time I read the Bible, I see it with different eyes. Yes. Holy Spirit. Yeah. Holy Spirit. I'm like, I never saw it like that before. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to explain that to Ron. I said, Ron, you're reading this today. Now, five years from now, if you sit down and read this, I said, you won't see the same thing. And so I was trying to get him to understand 
that God moves with the different seasons That's as right. well. With, and personal seasons. <laughs> well, you know, the Bible is the living word of God. Exactly. And, you know, I always think of it as a bush that's growing. And if we water it, if we read it, which is watering it, it's going to grow. You know, and every time you read it, like you said, you get something different out of it. Yeah. You just have to be obedient, you know, to, to do what God wants you to do. If you love him, which is what the next scripture says, mm -hmm. you're going to be obedient. You know, it's kind of like when I was a kid, I always liked to please my mom and dad because I knew if I didn't, yeah. I was going to get the wrath, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, but you it, you want to please somebody that you love. You know, when you're married, you want to try to please your husband because you love him. And we love God, so we want to please him, you know, try to please him in the way that we live. So, And, and one of the things, uh, Peter talked about this in Sunday school, about loving God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was a baby Christian, I'm thinking, how can I love God? You know, because we're not born loving God. And so I often thought about how can I love God like the scripture talks about. And what I've come to learn is the more that I study his word and the more that he reveals to me about himself and the more he's active in my own life and showing me miracles and getting me through difficulties, that's how I come to love him. Uh, that's me. That's my, my personal. Because you know him. Yes. And the, and the more you read about him and the more you study him, the more you know him. And then you begin to see the spiritual world. And most people don't see it. And they don't see it because they haven't stuck with it long enough. So if you keep, I told Ron, if you keep sticking with it long enough, what's boring and what's dry to you will come alive. And you'll begin to see things that nobody else can see. Because the Word of God is alive. Yes. It is. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And God is, is, alive. Alive. God is a covenant God. God. We have to remember how much of a covenant God He is. And everything that we do or say has con consequences. And I don't know if you count the ifs in here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have to read it carefully. <laughs> if, if you do this, then this is going to happen. Exactly. If you do that, then this is going to happen. And and he has warned us all through the word yeah. how important his covenant is. Yeah. And we'll be blessed if we do what he has commanded us to do. So there's prerequisites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all choice. And I think a lot of people don't realize that there's prerequisites. Mm -hmm. And the prerequisites is if. Doing what they want to do in yeah. their own eyes. Doing, you know, that's all throughout the whole Old Testament. Mm -hmm. They we, did what they, they wanted to do in their own eyes. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, well, to your point, Sue, I think that that when we become Christians, and we talked about this last week, it's a surrender. You know, you have to totally surrender your life. And and I'll admit, when I first became a Christian, and maybe some of you, there was little pieces of my life that I was hanging on to, you know. But you can't do that. You have to totally surrender every single corner of your life. Um, because that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be obedient to Him. You know, and just like our parents when we were growing up, you know, we were to be obedient. And it's the same way with God. We're to be obedient. And, and it cracks me up when people say the Word of God is so old that it doesn't mean anything. Uh -huh. That scripture in Deuteronomy that she, that Lorraine just read, it mm -hmm. is apropos to what's to right now. Oh, yeah. You know, so. Adding to that, you know, uh, being obedient, I think God gives us opportunities to be obedient. This or morning, disobedient. Well, no, this morning I had a rearrangement of my time. I had drove all the way into Phoenix, oh, yeah. or Tucson, Phoenix, so. Tucson, and that got, like you know, I had to have have some stuff done medically, and then I was going to go on from there to Peter's neurologist and take care of some forms and things. Well, I left the folder at home. And oh. as I got in the car, I'm like, oh, no. And then I thought, Lord, what are you doing? How are you rearranging my day? Okay, and as I'm driving back, I'm thinking, okay, I can go to Bible study. I might be a little bit late, but I can rearrange. I can do some things that I needed to do with Penny today. And so I go, uh, maybe, I, maybe I've missed a big, big pile up right, in Tucson, yeah. uh -huh. and they're cleaning it yeah. up, and it'll take, you know, the whole after, until this afternoon where it's all clear by the time I go. 
So I, I'm letting God orchestrate how my day is flowing and perceiving it to be better than what my plan was. And, and we'll see how that all turns out. You know, God's faithful. He's good. He, he's going to do what, you know, if I'm obedient and just rest in Him and His scheduling, um, I'm probably going to find out that it would have been better than my own original plan. It would. Right. So we have you know, to be willing to move with God, as He says, you know, and make makes changes to our day. You know, we can be flexible to... Ellen, you know what you just did? You walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I want to, I want to. I pray that every morning, you know, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Yeah. Let me be a blessing to whoever I come in contact with. Don't, you know, as I'm reading my word in the morning, before I start my day, I'm asking him to let me be a blessing and never a curse to those I come in contact with. Amen. So, you know, I want to you follow, I want to be to obedient, I want to be, and just because my day didn't go like I planned doesn't mean I have to get stressed out mm -hmm. over it or angry over it. I'm just going to go in the next flow. He's taking a right turn and I'm going with him. So, and that's what it means that he wants everything. Yeah, he wants everything. He doesn't just want our obedience with tithing and yeah. and uh, being kind to our enemies or the whatever big stuff. He yeah. wants every thing. I, I don't know which uh, pastor, preaching pastor on TV said this. I think maybe Chuck Swindoll. He said God does, doesn't just want your obedience and your tithe and your attendance at church. He wants everything. Mm -hmm. Everything. Even when I'm out walking in the desert, I, I ask the Holy Spirit to show me which path to take. Mm -hmm. Because if I took the path that I wanted to take, I might run into a snake. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, we, we have a jealous God here. Yes. And if we don't give him every part of our life, he's jealous. You know, if we give time to something that doesn't glorify Him, and those um, are idols too. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And and so we we have to be <clears throat> obedient to, like Lorraine said, to give Him every part of our life, and because He is jealous. You know, um, you know, your spouse gets jealous if you don't give them every part of your life. Sometimes they do. You know, you have to talk it out, but. Mm -hmm. um, you know, God gives us rules to live by, and He knew what He was doing when He wrote them. You know, oh yeah, you know. He knows. You know, He gave us, He gave us His word. He gave, the whole story of Abraham and his family, the Israelites, the whole Old Testament, yeah. their story, the good, the bad, and the ugly, yeah. His promises, their rebellion, over and over and over again. Well, you know what? That story hasn't ended, That's and it right. is before us in the news every mm -hmm. single day. Mm -hmm. Israel is an example that God has put before us. A choice. A choice. Will you go this way? A choice for America, I think. Um, as well as individual. Will you go this way or will you go this way? Look at the results of this. Yeah, the, the minute that That's we right. forsake Israel, right. we are in big. And the minute we forsake God's word, and yeah. we're in yeah. trouble. We're in yeah. trouble. I mean, my Israel, prayer has been since, in rebellion. They, since they this do. war has started, that maybe more Israelis turn their hearts to God because I know they, there's yeah. it's so many of them have walked away from their religion. You know, they're living oh, in yeah. kind of a secular situation, and I, I, I don't know. It's horrible that, but I think war can do that. I think it can draw you closer yeah. to God, and I'm hoping that that happens in Israel. I've been praying for that that more people come back to. I think a lot of people are the ministries there are saying that. People are like that lady that was here a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night yeah. from Israel. That people are actually coming into the ministry mm -hmm. uh, in Tel Aviv. Jewish people wanting to know, Good. you know, what they have to say. So mm -hmm. I think I think it, some people are, you know. But it's it, but it's been going on for for years right. with Israel. Right. Oh, that's that's so you know, it, it's nothing new, but still. Moses was the one that took them out of 
Egypt and took him to the other side. Mm -hmm. And what did they do? He went up on the mountain to go talk to God and they were over here fornicating and all this kind of stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so been going on, on for everything. years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Table, oh, table you. number three. <laughs> I, I want to try to get as much in as we can. <laughs> <laughs> and we can talk about this all day long, right? Yeah. So table number three, uh, read John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. That was a biggie for me. Yeah. yeah. Keep them. Because if you don't keep the commandments, then it's exposing who you are. <laughs> You don't love me if you it don't exposes obey who you are. what I say to do. Right? Yeah. And then table number four. I'm going to read Romans 6. Don't you know Jesus. that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? Okay, and then Hebrews 13, 17 says... Me, if you want to. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Exactly. So, I, I, and I just want to add this. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authorities. When the leader is following God, I just want to add that. <laughs> well, the thing of it is, they're not our leaders; they're our representatives. Yeah. yeah. That the people now, Pastor and, jo and Joanne are the leaders in the church. They're our leaders, mm -hmm. but they're our spiritual. The government leaders. is not exactly our leader. Oh, they're our representatives. Yeah. Yeah. But I, but I have been, I have been in my in my uh, time as a Christian. I have been in churches that were so ungodly, I had to get out of there. They call themselves Christian churches. Absolutely did. Because yep. there's some that do that are I'm talking that about the head of the church mm -hmm. was God. Then you got the pastor. Oh. And when the peop the leadership like oh. is corrupt, <laughs> then yeah. if you stay there, you become corrupt. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So, I just want you to know that you, that's why you got to know the Word of God for yourself. And so, uh, John uh, 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And in 1 Peter um, 1, 14, it says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. That means that as you grow spiritually, you can't go back to what you knew was old. And as a matter of fact, you just want to continuously grow spiritually. And it, it's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. And I think that's what a lot of people that come into the faith think that you got to change overnight. And it doesn't happen overnight. Even though there's some, some faith that teaches that that's supposed to happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. You grow into it. That's why the more you feed yourself the Word of God, the more you grow. In my father's generation, um, he, he died at 93 three years ago. But his feeling was, if you are living a sinful life, if you, if, you know, whatever is sinful to that person, whether it's drinking or anything, then you shouldn't go to church until you get yourself straight. Oh, and then you go to church. Oh, <laughs> you yeah, you got to clean yourself up. There was a whole lot of people in that generation, and probably are today, who don't go to church because they think they aren't in the right position to come to church. That if they were really sincere, they wouldn't be drinking or whatever their issue is. And that's not the case. The church is full of hypocrites that are trying not to be. Yeah, we come and we need to Good grow. Work. We need to know. We need to be taught. We need to be ministered to. And we're, we know we're not perfect. But, and, but we're trying to do better. And I wish we could, as people out in communities and families, 
let them know that it's okay to come just like you are because no one in that church is perfect. No one. Some do better than others in our eyes, but we don't know their hearts, you know. I don't want to say it to other people, but we just don't know people's hearts. But don't. I wish they knew it was okay to come and, and let us help you find God more and more and more. Well, the darkness hates the light. That's yes, right. it does. But we do have to make it clear that you, you'll never get better on your own. Right. That's mm -hmm. true. That's how they you'll need never to get come better in. on your own. Because Jesus said, said to the woman at the well, this water you'll never thirst. Yeah, and, and I don't think a lot of people understand that part of church is a so you can grow and that you can become sanctified over time. And uh, like you say, we can't do it ourselves. They need the help mm -hmm. of God, the Holy Spirit. So if, if anyone is in a situation where there that might be someone's hesitation and going, well, I'm not, I'm not right to go, I'm not good enough to go, mm -hmm. if we could help them to understand, God wants to help you do better well, without you have a being lot of people judgmental. That are in the church already, <laughs> I call them Pharisees, who think she needs to take that off. She's That's showing right. too much. Leave them alone. Let the Holy Spirit convict them. That's right. You yeah. know, a lot of them run away and they don't ever come back because somebody said something to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, about what they had on. Let the Holy Spirit do its work. I think yeah. part of the reason for that is a, because of what the church, church has your hand up. become in the past. A one hour a week on Sunday. You, you dress up, you wear your best clothes, right? Mm -hmm. You had school clothes, you had church mm -hmm. outfit. And so anyone, a kid, who comes from a bad home life, I had a student that mm -hmm. actually came to my church, which was an Assembly of God church, came on a Wednesday night, he was stoned, oh, and he had a t-shirt on <laughs> that was very vulgar. Mm -hmm. He truly did not know any better. He had never had an example mm -hmm. of how to behave in church and how to act, but his heart... His heart was seeking healing. Yeah. And there were people that said, look, yeah. you should tell him to leave with that t-shirt. Yeah. I said, I'm not telling him to leave. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit has brought him here. Yeah. As right. far as That's I'm right. concerned. We have this to is where he, to where he needs to be. The church is to be a hospital That's right. to people like that. Not a, not a, not a um, there you go. You know, um, I want to say people that are dressed up with mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. can I, the church I grew up, women had to wear hats. So, you know. Oh, yes. So, well, we all yeah. wore dresses. So, yeah. They still awesome. have churches yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 I went to a church in high school. There was a lady, we called her the hat lady. Uh, yeah. Always had a hat on. That's me. And it was, Sunday morning. It was That's bless me abundant. every week with a bigger hat. That's, oh. You have to wear those put a veil on. Okay, I wanted to get that ready. I wanted to make sure I got it right this week. So, um, I read somewhere, I don't even remember what book it was, that as we get closer and closer to the end times, which we are now, people are, that did stuff in their old day and have become born again, mm -hmm. how many of you have seen people so tattooed up, you couldn't even tell what nationality they were? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now imagine a person like that getting saved mm -hmm. and now they're coming yeah. to church. Yeah. How would we respond to Good. Absolutely. Jimmy Can Baker's son is tattooed from head to toe and he's a street minister. And yeah. He's tattooed and pierced and everything, but he's in Atlanta and he does a great job, you know, being a street minister. So Yeah. And he'll get their attention. Yeah. He'll, he'll probably well, he can relate to other people. Exactly. Other people. You know. Yeah. I couldn't do it. An old white woman trying to minister to, to these Tattooed drug addicts, you we know. get to the right tats. You know, so yeah. Maybe <laughs> well, you have to be henna because I don't want to be tatted. So. I used to work at a at a, a Christian uh, camp up in the White Mountains, and we would have these Christian motorcycle clubs come in. And I'll tell you what, I had some amazing biker boys you know come in and they looked scary and yeah. they loved Jesus and it was fun to watch them interact and mm -hmm. and it was fun to interact with them but yeah you you would be scared to death if you looked at them coming at you but it was but the secret to that is look at the eyes because the eyes are the windows of your soul exactly yeah 
So I guess we should never judge on appearance. No, we, we can't thing. because we never know. And we, we had a guy that came to church who was a alcoholic, and he was trying to come to church to fight it. In that uh -huh. brave man, yes, I, I should say that's trying to fight. He's even drunk to church. He was sincere. And people, you know, some people would say, oh, "You shouldn't let him in," you know. But but the church, our pastor did, and I'm so thankful, you know. Uh, and we need to take a lesson from everything said here. Just uh, love everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't judge. Yeah. Just you know, I'm reminded too, <laughs> since me and Ron are in the book of John, it, it talks about all that. Mm -hmm. When uh, they brought the woman who was caught in adultery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they were ready to stone her. <laughs> yeah. And then... Um, you know, they, they told Jesus, well, you know, what should we do? And Jesus is writing on the ground. And I often thought, what is he writing and what is he thinking? Is he just stalling for time to make them think about what they're doing here? And then he says, whoever is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So we, you know, we're pointing the finger at everybody else. Just point the finger at us. <laughs> you think he was writing the names of the men involved in this? Yeah, probably. <laughs> hope that. I often yeah. wonder, like you, what did he? What was he writing? That Publishing made them step the back the men's names. names right here, sir. Yeah, I, I don't know what he did. He was very wise. Yeah. He was very wise. He was. Well, you know, and Jesus, uh, Valerie, he didn't. He didn't preach to regular people. You know, he was preaching to prostitutes to tax collectors to, to the dregs of the earth, you know. And he didn't go into the, the high end neighborhoods. He went into the you know, the the, the yeah. neighborhoods that really needed salvation. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and that's the way we should be. Like like Carolyn said, we should welcome everybody. Look at you what know? he did look at what he did when when they were doing the tax uh, in, in, in the and he saw what they were doing and he got that table and you know, this is the house of my father. You don't do tax collectors here. I'm like, oh. They were selling, they were selling stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And he, you know, maybe, you know, some people don't believe. And, but I think that he really did that back in the day. Because you wouldn't, you, you would He's a, he's, he was always calm. Jesus was always calm. I love the way Jesus sure, talked. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time that, that was, maybe he did. Oh, when he was turned over the money yeah. yeah. That was righteous. Money money changed. Changed. Yeah. 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 And he preached. Oh, boy, did he preach. His anger like, was at yeah. the people in the church. Yeah. You know, and I'm getting people. people. I know. <laughs> people taking advantage of people. In the yes, he, yes. And he didn't like that. Well, isn't the condition of the church in America the reason America is in the condition it's exactly. it's in America? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's why we have people. To, we have to pray That's for people right. in leadership. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 29 says, But uh, Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Mm -hmm. And then in 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So a lot of people do think that they're, they're burdens. But if you just try it, I always tell people, just try it. I said, you give up too soon. You know, <coughs> well, I've tried this and I've tried that. I said, just keep trying it. Just keep doing it. You know, there's so many words in there for this is the love of God that you keep right then. He didn't make those commandments for himself. Right. So much as he made them for us to give us a better life. Because if you if you follow those commandments, your life is going to be better than if you don't. Mm -hmm. So this is his love for us. His protection for us. And then in, in Isaiah 119, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And then Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you to do? Well, that's, that's a big one. That's a big one. That is a big one. That's a yeah. one right there. Yeah, that is. So I found a video. It's not the best of the videos, but it's, 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 I think it'll get the point across. <laughs>
exactly like he did Abraham. For God to attest that I am a man after his own heart, like he said about David. If you're a busy mom like me, book a spring cleaning for only $19. My friend recommended Home Glow, so I got a three hour cleaning while I was at my kid's soccer game. Everything. To be an exceptional believer, to do all those extraordinary stuff, to have those big testimonies and those were it not for God's stories. It is something we all crave, even yourself. You want to grow in the spirit. You want to mature in your faith. You want to move from one level to another. You want to reach this point in your walk with God where you never imagined. Do you know what God needs? At first, I thought I need to pray the loudest and longest. I just wanted to make this comment on page four. As you're watching this video, make a list of things that stand out to you, and we'll discuss them. I need to read the Bible five chapters a day. I need to give and give and give. I need to be the first one to be at church every Sunday, and so many things of that kind. It is not entirely wrong. God wants all of that from us. He wants me and you to do all that and even more. But above that, he requires obedience. Obedience, obedience, obedience. You can do all of that, but if you are not obeying God, it will be in vain. You can be the most faithful giver of tithes, but if you are disobedient to our creator, it will be fruitless. You can pray all you want. You can give alms to the needy, you can take in orphans and clothes and feed them and do everything you think is good. But without obedience, that will be nothing in the eyes of God. Let's look at this illustration from the Bible, Samuel 13. The armies are coming up against Saul and his men, and a sacrifice needs to be done to seek the favor of God. Samuel is the one to offer the sacrifice, according to what God had commanded. But Saul knows better than to wait. He grows very impatient. And after all, it's almost battle time, and if we don't do the sacrifice, we might be defeated. So he goes ahead and sacrifices. But immediately when he is done, Samuel shows up and tells him what a foolish thing he has done. In a nutshell, disobedience is foolishness, and to disobey God is to be foolish. Obedience is better than any sacrifice we can ever make. Obedience is better than everything that we can do for God. It goes beyond all of that. And why is it this way? Obedience goes deeper into the heart. It shows willingness and faith. Without faith, you cannot obey God. So what God wants actually is obedience based on faith. The holy book in Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And how does our faith show? When we obey God, faith-driven obedience, where you obey because God said, and if he said, then for sure it will happen. I have faith in what God says, therefore I will do what he asked me to, without question or doubt. Why is Abraham called the father of faith? Because he was obedient to God. He never questioned God, he never complained. He never doubted the capabilities of God, but he simply obeyed. Not partially, but entirely. And he did so because he believed in God. Let's look at the story in Luke 5. Jesus told Simon to cast his nets deeper into the waters, and Simon answered in verse 5, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, and went on to say, But because you say so, I will let down the nets. On your word, we will do it. That is the obedience that God wants from you. It is all he needs, the faith-driven obedience. When you are ready to say, God, I have tried this thing before and failed terribly, but on your word, I will try it once more. I have done this before and I didn't like it, but on your word, let me do it once again. My family says it's impossible, but I choose to obey and have faith in you. My finances are laughing at me because where on earth could I ever get this huge amount of money for this project? But on your account, I will do it. My environment is not the most supportive of my idea, but I don't care. Because you said it, Lord, I will do it. No one is supporting me. Everyone thinks I'm going nuts. It all sounds crazy, but I have faith in you, God. I believe and I'm going to do exactly what you said. Obedience. The scripture continues in verses 6 and 7. When they had done so, 
They caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. They signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Their nets began to break, but for good reason. You need to get to that point of blessings in God such that you can't handle it on your own anymore. Obey. You want to be blessed with so much that you need someone to help. Obey. You're farmed to produce so much that you can give out. Obey God. I don't mind my nets breaking if it's for a good cause. I don't mind my boat sinking, but it's for a good reason. I don't mind it at all if I have to yell and shout for help, as long as it is for a good reason. I have no problem with that at all. But first I need to obey God. God wants me to obey Him, even if I have been fishing all night and caught nothing, when he says, cast your nets deeper, I need to do exactly that. When he says, move to this place, I need to do exactly that. When he says, I need you to do this for me, I need to do exactly that. No more, no less. Faith and obedience. When circumstances say no, obey. When your own gut says no, obey. When you have no means, no money, no nothing, obey God. When you can't seem to find any way to do that thing, just obey. Obey even when you can't see where this will lead to. Sometimes we want assurance, a sign, anything that will show us that this is the right direction. But that is not how God operates. God operates entirely by faith, and faith is what breeds obedience, and obedience trust, and out of all those, the blessings of God. Abraham had no idea where he was going, but he obeyed. Look at the fishermen. They obeyed Jesus and that led to the biggest, biggest catch of the fish they could ever get. I bet it was even more than they had caught for a week. It was double what their boat could take. The Bible in Ephesians 3.20 says that God can do abundantly and exceedingly more than we could ever ask for. These fishermen were only looking for a substantial amount of fish. But look what they caught, exceedingly and abundantly more than what they had imagined. He is the God of abundance, the God of exceedingly more than enough, the God of excess, the God of overflowing blessings. Favor upon favor, grace upon grace, from one level to another. All he needs is total obedience, absolute obedience. He wants a yes, Lord, I am willing. Yes, Lord, right away. Yes, Lord, on it. Yes, God, let me do that. Yes, God, I will do this with a pure and willing heart, with obedience, with gladness. Simon and his companions upgraded from being fishers of fish to fishers of men. Luke 5.10, then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. He moved them from one level to another simply because they obeyed. The fish were just a glimpse. Helen Hansel was able to win at any competition she took part in. She was known as the contest queen because she had won seven trips to Paris, boats, houses. A glimpse of what Jesus could do. It was just a hint, an idea. It was not the end of miracles, but just the beginning. The whole purpose was different. Jesus had something bigger and better for them. What about if that thing that God is calling you to do is just a fraction of what he can do? What if there is more that lies behind this first level that he wants you to get through? What if this mighty blessing he wants to give you is just a tip of the iceberg? Will you get to experience the mega blessings? Will you graduate from being a fisher of fish to a fisher of men? Will you upgrade? Will you move from this current level to the next level? Will you please God enough to entrust you with even more than you could ever ask of? Will Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Have you been faithful enough to God to be entrusted with even more of his glories in his kingdom? How much can obedience do? It can save a whole mankind, a whole creation. Romans 5.19, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. So also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. I don't know whether you are really getting the magnitude, the impact, the results, the power of obedience. The consequences of disobedience in Genesis is sin and death. Straight up, 
disobedience itself is a sin. One man disobeyed and the whole of the human race became sinners. But the fruit of abundance through the death of one man is salvation and eternal life. The call to live a godly life is a call to obedience. Since the beginning of times all through, obedience has become a core part of our faith in God. The first man failed. Many men after him failed. Even you and I at some points have failed. But God gave us a Redeemer. On our own, we could not do it. He gave His only Son. Jesus walked in holiness and perfect obedience to His Father, our God. He had no sin, not even a single one. And by His obedience, He became the perfect sacrifice that could atone our disobedience and sins. That is how much obedience can do. It can redeem people. It can restore a broken relationship. It can be the breakthrough to blessings abounding. It can be what stands between you and the Father. Obedience is the only thing that God needs from you. He has availed it to us through the death of His Son and the Holy Spirit. It is now very possible to obey God, and He wants you to. I hope you understand how important it is for you to do it. I pray that from this moment on you will be happy, eager, and willing to obey God, because your obedience is the only thing He needs from you. Did y'all write something down? <laughs> I did write it down, but one thing the Lord has been teaching me about obedience is um, I was raised in a church where you did all the right things, you know, so that kind of have, sometimes I can have kind of a Pharisee mindset. If I don't do all these things, then um, I'm not loving God enough. But what he's been teaching me is that Matthew 36 through 40 said, Master, which is the greatest commandment? Um, and Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what he said, you can do all those, you know, you can, you can tithe, you can do all the, the things that you think you need to do without love. Like in First Corinthians, it's just, you're just a clinging symbol. It means nothing. So what the Lord's been teaching me about obedience is to love him and love others. And then everything else will follow. Because if you love God and you love others, then you're going to want to obey all the other the other things. So a lot of times I said, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm just a clinging symbol today. <laughs> Please help me not to be that. So what he said there, you can do all these things, but if your motive isn't right and your heart's not right, then they mean nothing. Or, I love Veggie Tales. Did you ever watch Veggie Tales? <laughs> oh yeah. And there was this one that said, um, the little Tweedle guy was saying, "But Lord, why didn't you make everybody love you?" And he said, "Because a gift demand, a gift demanded is not a gift at all." So it's like I think the Lord wants us to love Him for who He is, and out of that love, we want to follow Him. We want to obey His commandments. We want to do all those things. And sometimes you have to make the choice where you don't feel like it. Say, Lord, I don't feel like loving this person. But you, love is not a feeling all the time. It's just still an action, but it's the motive, your heart motive. So, thank you for sharing. I, um, I think the more you understand what's written in the scripture, the more you can appreciate what God has done for us. You know, when Adam and Eve messed it up, God still loved us. And he didn't give up on us. He provided a way for us to escape mm -hmm. and to get it right again. And that within itself is, is worth loving him. Mm -hmm. Oh, I messed, we, you know, Adam messed it up for us, but you made a provision where we can get back into a right relationship with you. And so you provided your son. But it's not automatic. And, and I've had people to say, Oh, I'm, I'm good. God gave us a son. Yeah, but it's not automatic. you got to work with him. <laughs> one, of, one of the things that they said in that film that really hit me was, without faith, you can't obey God. You know, if you, if you don't have faith... That's the foundation. Yeah, you know, obeying God. Why would... 
Yeah, I mean, and it doesn't come right away. Mm -mm. You know, it's one of those things, it's a, I mean, we're all works in progress. I'm not there, none of us are there. You know, we just keep, you know, working at it. And, and that's, and one of the other thing it said, you will be blessed and happy if, if you obey. And boy, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, even as a child, you know, you were so much happier if you obeyed your parents. Yeah. And it's the same way with God. We're going to be so much happier if we obey what he wants us to do and obey the laws that he's given us to live by. So it's, um, you said it wasn't a very good video, and I thought it was great. You know. Well, he said a couple of things that I kind of cringed a little bit, but then he straightened it out later. <laughs> so, so how do you get faith? Obey. Uh, well, the more you do it, the more you, the more you can do it. How does the Bible say you get faith? By hearing the word. By hearing, by hearing the word. By hearing the word. Yeah. So, if if you want to reach your unsaved family members, and you live in the house with them, the Lord taught me that when you put on music, put it down real low, just enough so they can hear it praise and worship, and just let it play all day. <laughs> You'll be surprised how peace your house will become. Just let it play all day. You know, when I wake up in the morning and I, I can see Ron is in an argumentative mood, let me go praise and worship. <laughs> it works. Somebody hit their hand right here. Yeah, you I got this lesson last week. Uh, we were at my daughter's and we were helping to babysit the four kids, and I kind of took <laughs> I took care of the two little boys. Well, I was also helping in the kitchen, and she had a new dishwasher, right, with a longer door. Every time I turned that direction, I hit my same oh, no. place in my leg oh. on the on the corner there, and I'm like trying to get the little guys ready and out the door and everything, and I'm like ah. I'm not quite swearing, but really close, because I keep smacking it on the same place. And then I heard ask Justice to pray for you, and I'm like, he's seven years old, Lord. <laughs> and, and I thought, no, you've learned. Go ask. And I thought he would just, you know, make his noises and make faces and stuff. And I said, can you pray for my leg? I keep running into the dishwasher and I keep hitting it and it was already turned black and blue and swelling and everything. And I said, where it's black and blue? So that kid dropped straight to his knees, put his hand right on it and, and prayed wow. like, okay, Jesus, here's the problem. You're going to solve it. <laughs> it wasn't black and blue when he took his hand off and there wasn't any pain. I'm telling you, kids are yes. what? You know, the Bible says yes. until they become like little children. That's right. That's right. right. <laughs> Without all the noises. Yeah. But I mean, it's, and he's like, okay, let's go to school. How does he know all this? Well, so you got to do that more often. No, my leg can't. <laughs> no, but not that part. That's what she meant. Oh, that part. Yeah, that part. <laughs> Anybody else write something down? Yeah, Danny. Yeah, what? Share oh. with them what his last words were. Oh, right. the next day I was doing it again, and they said, oh, no, we've got to pray over it again. So he prays over it again, same thing. And he says, and Jesus... Can you show my grandma how not to run into the dishes? Oh, <laughs> there we go. Like, yeah. From the mouths of babes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then he gets up and goes his way. I don't know. He's, he's funny. Okay. Well, let's go back to the pastor on page 21 in the book. Okay. Um, he said that he would rather obey God than please man. But in the end, he was glad that he stayed connected to the vine and held his relationship with Christ as the guiding force in his life. And then it's said in, in, in that uh, particular story that because he was obedient and stayed uh, in the right relationship with him, his response to that couple bore fruit later. The couple that had been angry with him reminded him, remain, I'm sorry, remained in the church 
and later their daughter was converted and baptized. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when we're being obedient, God already has a master plan how he's going to yeah. use us. So if he had us given those people his peace of mind and the flesh, then this wouldn't have happened, never happened. The daughter would not have not uh, have been in this church and given her life to the Lord and got baptized. So a lot of lot of our actions is going to lead into somebody else's life and bless somebody else. Another thing that they said uh, real quick was faith breeds obedience. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, you know, that's true. Faith be breeds obedience. I can remember after I lost my husband, I went through grief share twice, and, and I told I went to Joanna and David to, to talk to him about the ministry, and I kept putting it off when I wanted. They, they saw the, the curriculum. I told them to look at this and everything, and they said, oh, great, you know. And I kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. But Joanne says, when are you get I said, I'm not ready. I said, I'm so grieving. She said, Penny, you're ready. You just need to be obedient to what God wants you to do, and you're going to be happier. And boy, that's a truth. Mm -hmm. You know, when God calls you to do something, you know, you, it, it's just like when he called me to do children's church. You know, I was, how old was I then? Um, probably 70. Mm -hmm. And 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 I I said God I'm 70 years old and he says yeah but Moses was 80. <laughs> you know that no Moses, excuses. Just as clear as like, he was sitting right next to me he says Jesus says Moses was 80 when I called him to lead the people out of out of Egypt you know so you know age has no bearing on it. No if God called you to do it he's going to make sure that it gets done. Yeah has anybody in here. Has God ever dropped anything in your spirit? You're thinking, oh, I can't do that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Many times. Mm -hmm. And then you follow through, and the very thing that you thought you weren't going to get, God supplied it. That happened to me with that book that I wrote. It started off as something in a conversation with a coworker. She was telling me about her son, because her and her son had... Uh, a really good relationship and then he got engaged and then he was getting married and then she said I'm gonna miss that relationship and then I said well he's getting a wife now I said why don't you write some little motherly wisdom to him and make it out of a book and give it to him you know on the wedding day so he can reflect back on it so we were talking like that and then she said well that sounds like a really good idea and so I get in my car to go home, and the Lord said, how are you going to tell her what to do for her kids, and you haven't done nothing like that? <laughs> thinking, you know, and I knew it was the Lord, because how did that thought come back to me like that? You know, and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm giving her advice. I said, I haven't done nothing. And so all of the stuff that I had been telling my kids, I knew they weren't hearing me. You know, it was just bouncing off the wall, and that's the way I felt, and I was talking to the Lord about it. And the Lord said, well, write it down and make it plain. And that's how that book actually really became into uh, existence. And then I started, um, several people that worked in the office with me had uh, backgrounds in, in English literature. So I would have them to make correct all my mistakes. They would read it, you know. And then I had one Jehovah Witness to tell me, what religion are you? And I said, I'm a Christian. She said, because everything you're saying in here, I really like it. You ought to have that published. Mm -hmm. And so that was, a, to me, that woke me up because she was Jehovah Witness and they don't read stuff like that, you know. <laughs> and uh, she was an English major before she became a counselor. And so I said, okay. Um, and somebody else told me, it was about three or four people that told me that. So then I said, I can't, I can't afford to have nothing like this published, you know. And then after the last person told me that, I said, well, let me check it out. Let me, let me check it out. So I checked a publishing company that a friend of mine wrote a book and had it published there. So I, I called, and it was on a Saturday. And the person answered the phone and said, well, we're not, normally not open. And I usually don't even answer the phone on Saturday. And I told him what I was doing. I'd never done it before. And can you kind of guide me as to how this happens? And so she said, hold on, I think that the director is here. 
And she said, if, if he doesn't answer, it'll go in the voicemail. You can call me back. So he answered. I'm like, oh. So I, he said, well, what kind of book do you want to write? So I told him what I just told you guys. And he said, oh, yeah, we need a book like that. So the more I talked to him, he gave me a discount. And so it's like, okay, everything is just working in my favor. You know, it was just like, and then I said, well, I still don't have the money <laughs> to do that. And four days later, that's what I'm saying. When God starts doing miracles before your eyes and you start saying I mean, he just leaves you speechless. There's nothing else you can say, but I know it's you, God. Four days later, I don't even know how this even happened. I got a letter from the bank telling me that I had a, that they had sent me a check four years ago that I had never cashed. It was an escrow overage. And they said, you have until this date to call us or we're sending it to the state. I'm like, what? And so when I looked it up, it was the, the amount that I needed to publish the book. And so I'm thinking, they said they sent me a check. How could, how could I miss a check? <laughs> and so when I got the money, I'm thinking in my mind, I'm going on vacation. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit came in and said, that's not what that's for. Just as plain and simple, it's for that book. And I was so tempted to say, oh, that's, that's just a coincidence. That's not the Lord talking. You know how you want to justify it? And I was justifying it, and I could just feel it in my spirit that, no, that was for the book. So if the Lord is placing something in your spirit, and you don't see any way for it to happen, just sit back and just say, OK, Lord, if you want this to happen, then please supply me. And when he supplies you, don't say it's a coincidence. That's when the enemy comes in to sway you away. And then um, finally, when I, when I got it ready to get it published and everything like that, I didn't know what kind of book cover to get. And the Lord was telling me, I got your book cover. And I'm like, OK, what could it be? And so the publishing company had book covers they could offer, but I didn't like any of those. And I was cleaning something, and I ran across the old self-portrait that I took when I was in photography school. And it was a picture of me 30-something years ago. I said, oh, this goes with the title, hindsight. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I used. So I'm just saying, when it's God, he'll show you it's him. You know, you, you don't need to, to have a whole lot of... Um, People come up and tell you, but by the Spirit of God, He will show you that you're on the right track. You know, He used my co worker, who was a Jehovah Witness, who would have ever thought. He used a couple of other friends. He used the publishing company to show me I'm on the right. Okay, He's giving me a discount. Who does that? And uh, then the book cover. And People just encouraging you. From, that, from there, it's just history. Mm -hmm. and your book got published. And a lot of people kept saying, well, how much money did you make off of it? And I would say, well, honestly, I didn't do it to make money. Because writing a book is not really easy. Because a couple of times I got off track, and the Holy Spirit just kept me up. And that was obedience. And, and, and I didn't have an excuse, because it was during COVID. And so we were working at home. I didn't have to go to work every day. I was working at home. So if the Lord has something for you to do, he will, he, he'll, he'll, without a doubt, show you that's what you're supposed to do. And it was all by, mostly by his spirit and a few witnesses. And the few witnesses weren't even Christians. OK, so the benefits. We're not going to get through all of this. But if you go through to page five, it, it talks about individuals who were obedient to God in various ways. Now just think if these people just blew God off and didn't follow through.
you know, Abraham, he followed God's command to leave his home. Now, to leave your home and to go off somewhere you don't know anything about. A lot of people ask me, how did you do it, Valerie? Because when I got here, I really didn't know anybody. And um, I knew I wanted to get away from the ice and the cold. <laughs> I knew that I had visited here with my mother to visit my daughter when she was a travel nurse. And I didn't know she was going to move after I moved here. So that left me with nobody. <laughs> and I just said, you know what? This is a great start. I had just lost my mother. I needed to get out of that old house anyway. You know, get away from all of that. Get away from the old stuff. And the people that I had been ministering to back then, we did it all on Zoom. So I still had them. I still had the support. And so, you know, I get here into a new place. And then when I, uh, I didn't know anybody on my block when I moved in. So I was praying, you know, please let this be a nice place, Lord. And uh, as I got the key to the house and was going into the house, this lady across the street was yelling at me. And I'm like, who's that, you know? And I met her halfway. She said, are you the new person? You know? <laughs> and I said, yeah. She said, well, welcome. You just moved into the best neighborhood in the world. And I just felt that was just God, you know, telling me that. <laughs> and then the next thing I know, she, she said, and I hadn't even gone in the house yet. Such and such lives there. This person lives there. And I'm thinking, how am I supposed to remember all these people? You know? <laughs> And then the first party they had, was a, I think it was a 4th of July party. She came over. She said, we're having a 4th of July party at that house right there at this time. And I'm coming over here to get you because you're the new princess on the block. Oh. And I'm like, this. <laughs> so to me, that's God. You know, that's just God doing that. So anyway, if nobody else welcomes you, the Lord knows how to do it. <laughs> Okay, so Moses, he followed God's instructions to lead the Israelites out of slavery. And can you imagine what that must have been? No. Okay. <laughs> so awesome. Can you imagine? <laughs> you, you have to be connected to the Lord to do yeah, yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then we see right here that David had all those flaws. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he was after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. And then Esther, what about her? Oh my gosh. Can you imagine being her? Such a time as this. Yes. And then Daniel, I got a picture of Daniel hanging up on my uh, wall with all those lions. And then Mary, the mother of Jesus, oh my goodness. Oh yes, she went in that day. I know. So, you know, these are just a few examples to let you know that it, it, what seems impossible is not impossible when God is behind it. Well, you know, Valerie, I think about the disciples, too. Look how obedient they were to, to do what God wanted them to do. You know, follow me. And they did, I mean, they just did it, you know. and They dropped everything. They dropped everything. And here's this man that, you know, they weren't really sure who he was, but... Yeah. But they felt like they were to follow him, you know, and I thought, oh my yeah, gosh. I think it was the drawing of the Spirit. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And Abraham, too, not just leaving his homeland, taking his only son he waited yeah. forever for exactly. to sacrifice him. Exactly. Yeah. God provided the rain. So we can learn a lot from um, the characters within the scripture. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that God starts out that dramatic. It's little by little, and then it gets dramatic. <laughs> At least with me. You know, it's, he started out little, do this, you know. And then uh, by the Spirit, I'm, okay, I think God's talking to me. You know, and then the, the deeper you get into it, then the deeper the request. But you can do it. We think Jesus learned obedience through suffering. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I, I have learned my biggest obedience through maybe making poor decisions. I, I grew up with an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. And so um, back in the 70s when nobody knew what it was. Mm -hmm. But it was rebellion. It was yeah. rebellion against my parents, against authority. 
all those things. I mean, I still struggle with it a little bit, but um, he led me out of that. But I had to get to the point where it was so horrible that he said, okay, just do one thing, and then just do the next thing. And he, you know, so I think that my greatest lessons of obedience have been through suffering. Unfortunately, sometimes that makes other people suffer too. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what builds our faith. And you can look back on those times and say, well, I obeyed you in that moment, mm -hmm. in that situation. So mm -hmm. I know that if I obey you again, mm -hmm. it's going to lead to that, to that freedom. Mm -hmm. And then it builds your faith because you know he's going to yeah. do it again. It does. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are our miracles that we can look yes. back on. Mm -hmm. Is that when we think something's impossible and then it actually happens? You know. Well, you know, I think I think about Noah building the ark. You know, and it's like, yeah. <laughs> you here's that? here's <laughs> this thing that's 510 feet long, and he's telling everybody he's going to flood, and they're living in a place where the desert they got yeah. bushes that are about a foot tall. You know, and it's like and it's they said it had never rained. Yeah, yeah, yeah never, never rained. rained. Can you imagine how his neighbors must have laughed at him? And stuff, and it's like, I mean, this thing wasn't little. Yeah. It was huge. Okay. It took 120 years. Oh, God came to you. Mm -hmm. That's a long time to go. I know. Yeah. Everybody think you know that. So, yeah. Yeah. so I think God is teaching us something. Yeah. He may tell us something today that might take a long time. You don't. You know, we, we may begin to start it, but it could be happening when we're almost at the point where we can't work anymore then it happens. Mm -hmm. So we just have to be um, alert mm -hmm. as to how God speaks to us. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, it's almost 12 o'clock, so what, we want, what I want you to think about is has there been a time um, that you took a step towards what you believe God was telling you to do. Can I share one more thing? Mm -hmm. We have a youth group at our home church in Olympia. I mean Washington. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the Lord was telling me to give my testimony about the eating disorder, about uh, backsliding from the Lord, leaving a Christian home and doing all those things on my own, this rebellion. Oh, I can't do that, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I did, so I talked to the youth pastor and I said, this is what I believe the Holy Spirit is telling me to do, but if you don't feel like that that is it, just let me know. And so I, he said, no, I think that's good. So well, on a Sunday night when they have a youth program, when I gave my testimony about not everything, because people don't need to know everything, yeah. you know, right. but try to explain that, you know, we, the decisions we make, have consequences mm -hmm. not only for us but our you know others mm -hmm. and so learning to be obedient and the Lord never gives up on you he never I say Lord thank you so much for not giving up on me but doing that I was a nervous wreck because I'm not one for public speaking at all but I really felt like that that was important for young people to hear that they might see us as older Christians in the church mm -hmm. Oh, they've got it all together. They've never done anything wrong. Everything's good. But I think it's important for them to see that we've had our own struggles and how the Lord has brought us through that. So mm -hmm. I think giving our testimony is one of the biggest There's things. There's a thing mm -hmm. of spirit of intimidation. Mm -hmm. and, and the enemy operates like that. Mm -hmm. yep. If it's something that you feel that the Lord is giving you to do, mm -hmm. all of a sudden this fear and this like, ah, oh, no, nobody's going to benefit from this. Mm -hmm. You know, because you really don't want to get up in front of a bunch of people and tell personal stuff, you know. Yeah. But actually, somebody probably got blessed by that. They mm -hmm. could have been somebody in there that was struggling with that. Mm -hmm. You know, we never know why God has us to do certain things. And a lot of times, you may not, you may not even realize that somebody else is being blessed by it until very much later. So, I remember when I wrote the book, uh, my sister in Lord Carol Loretta, when I put that testimony in the book, she said, did you uh, let the pastor know that you wrote about him? I said, no. She said, you're not going to tell him? <laughs> I said, well, it's just the story. She 
said, you need to call him up and tell him that you're uh, putting a testimony about him in your book. I said, yeah, you're right. I should. So I did. I called him up, and he was an old, like when I first got saved. So I've been to like three or four churches since then. But it seems that he planted when I was first becoming a Christian. So uh, he wasn't hard to find. I found him. Called him up and told him that I was writing a book and I was giving my testimony. And I said, and you're in the book. He said, oh, really? I said, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, uh, every chapter that I did, I recorded it verbally. And I said, I'm going to send you the chapter that I'm talking about you. And so he called me back. He said, I just listened to it. And he was just shouting, thanking the Lord. I said, but that was a long time ago. He said, you have no idea. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so it's important to, to, to share when somebody has blessed you. Um, so anyway, he's the one that wrote the foreword to the book. He ended up writing the foreword to the book after I shared that. So tell him. So, you know, somebody's blessed you or, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Because it, it incur even though what he did, it said in the pulpit 30 something years ago, just now coming to fruition in a book, um, he rejoiced. As a matter of fact, I still can hear him rejoicing on the phone. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's a long time ago. <laughs> It was wonderful for him to know. Yeah. To see mm -hmm. So I called my sister up and I said, I told him. I said, he was all excited. She said, of course. Yeah. Valerie, <laughs> yeah. what's the name of your book? Hindsight Wisdom. Hindsight Wisdom. Didn't you get it? Did you get it? No. Oh, okay. I thought I heard you say you had it. No. Okay. Oh, is this the book that you wrote? No. 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 Oh, okay. Is it on eBay? I mean, it's you should be able to find it anywhere. If you put the title in, or if you put my name in, and then the title, it should pop up. What you're saying is so true about years later. It may be lots later, but um, I just my oldest daughter Heather's in her fifties, but when she was in school, she witnessed to another girl that was her friend. And that girl, uh, and told her something that she was doing wasn't, she shouldn't be doing. And so that girl kind of hacked off her friendship with Heather. And then it was either the 15 or 20 year class reunion. She, um, she wrote Heather a letter before and told her how thankful she was that Heather stood up for what was right and told her about God and that she was a Christian now. And, uh, you know, in part that was due to Heather. Mm -hmm. So it can be 20 years, it can be many years. You just it, never know. <laughs> no, in a little act of kindness or something you're not even aware of that should be in our characters as a Christian that sometimes we have to fight for. Um, when I was a little girl, evidently, I was very nice to one of a little girl that was in our community for a while, invited her to my house. Okay, when my, my father died three years ago, I'm 74. She wrote, I, I saw your dad passed away, I live in Fairfield, and do you remember me? Um, you had me come to your house and play, and you were always kind to me. I never even thought about being kind or what it was, but because of that, it made a difference in her life. Just something you don't even, aren't aware of, because I didn't think I need uh, random acts of kindness or being kind, but it should be in us and we don't know what those mean things we say or those or those kind of things we do, how they affect somebody all their lives. It was just amazing to me. Because I never thought of myself like that. Yeah. In ways we don't understand we can go either way on that. It's important to me. Okay, well that's the conclusion of this lesson. Would somebody like to close this out?